Good morning, friends. Happy Sabbath. And I want to welcome any who may be visiting. We know during this special time of year, we always have some friends that are migrating. I heard that yesterday was one of the busiest travel days in the country. And uh, so I know we've got visitors here that are maybe here seeing family. I've already met some. And welcome. We're glad you're at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church today. I want to also welcome the many who we know are watching with us online. And uh, I hear from people all along the East Coast. After they come home from church and they eat, it's the perfect time then to tune in for our program. And they worship with us. And this is a, a special time of year. Of course, you know, not only for all the obvious reasons. But for me, I, I especially like the Christmas season because... I find people are more open to spiritual things. They see all the trappings of Christmas, and in there they, they also hear references to Jesus and songs about Jesus, and, and they start asking questions. And the other reason is because the days finally start getting longer, and that gives me hope. I don't like the cold. But we all have a lot to be thankful for, friends. And uh, today... I want to talk about something that it's one of my favorite things to do. It's a Bible study that is very relevant for the season. And I've titled it 10 Powerful Prenatal Prophecies. You know, I like the subject of prophecy. There are over 400 prophecies in the Old Testament that foretold the coming of Jesus. And there's quite a few of them that are just talking about Jesus coming as a child not only his life and his ministry and his sacrifice, but we're going to specifically focus on those prophecies that deal with Jesus coming as a child. And, you know, I think if a person looks at this, it it inspires them with the, the purpose and the certainty of his mission. Now, back in Bible times, when they got together, uh, in the first century of the church, you realize there was no New Testament So most of their get-togethers had to do with studying the prophecies and showing how Jesus fulfilled them. Then they'd go to the teachings of Jesus. A couple of examples, Christ himself. When Jesus rose from the dead, he said in Luke 24, 27, And at the beginning, at beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Went through all the Old Testament, beginning at Moses, showing the things that talked about him being the Messiah. And then you can look in Acts 28, verse 23. So when they had appointed him a a day, many came to him at his lodging. This is Paul, who's in Rome. He's waiting for trial, but they gave him some freedom. To whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning till evening. How much time do you have? No, I won't do that. Paul preached too long once and Eutychus fell out a window, you remember? So it's not safe. But they used to have all day Bible studies and he would start with Moses and go through the prophecies. You think, well, how many are there? Hundreds. And so we're going to look at a few of them. I'm titled the sermon, 10 Powerful, Profound Prenatal Prophecies. Say that three times fast. So you'll be able to count along, and uh, I'm going to go to the first prophecy, and this is found, the first prophecy in the Bible, really, it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is after Adam and Eve sinned, and uh, the Lord is now, he's uh, announcing how things are going to change, they're not going to experience the immediately death penalty for sin, but uh, God says the ground is going to be cursed, it's going to be more difficult in conception and childbirth. And, uh, and then he says, after he talks to the man and the woman, he addresses this to the serpent. And this is Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity, that's a disagreement, anger, hostility, between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, the seed of the woman, that's Jesus, will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Uh, the wound that the serpent gets is mortal, bruises the head but the serpent has bruised the heel of the church and Christ, impeding the progress, fighting all along the way. Now, the point here I don't want you to miss, it says between your seed and her seed. This is the only time in the Bible it talks about the seed of a woman. 
Uh, the Bible is largely a, a patriarchal book. If you go to Genesis, it traces Jesus' genealogy through the fathers. It does mention four women, but always with the fathers. And you'll notice in Chronicles and Numbers, it's always tracing, it's patriarchal through the fathers. And there's several times it talks about his seed, whether it's the seed of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, but here it says the woman's seed. Because the birth of Jesus is the only time in the history of the world that a woman had seed without help from any man. You understand? And it was the seed of the woman, Christ, that would destroy the enemy, the church. And so that's the prophecy. Where do we see the fulfillment? We, all through this message, we're going to talk about foretold, prophecy foretold, prophecy fulfilled. That's our first prophecy. Here's the fulfillment. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Paul knew what that meant. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Hebrews 2, 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he, Jesus, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. In Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So it tells us about the, the prosperity of the seed of the woman and the ultimate fate of the serpent, the devil. What would happen? That's the first prophecy in the Bible. Prophecy number two, this is actually several prophecies wrapped up in one. It tells the exact ancestry of Jesus. People are very fascinated with... Uh, ancestry these days and they've got the DNA tests that you can take that not only track back your ancestors and it might help you find missing relatives but now of course they've got DNA tests that tell you about your genetics what diseases you might be disposed to and things you need to guard against and test for and it's getting ever increasingly more sophisticated what they can do with that testing but the Bible outlined exactly what family Jesus would come from and the Lord sort of like a, a target that kept focusing closer and closer, starting with Adam all the way to Jesus. Of course, said it would come through Seth, Adam's son Seth. Adam had other sons and daughters. And which son of Seth? Noah. It says Noah found grace, but he had three sons. Which son of Noah? Noah pronounced a special blessing on Shem. But which son of Shem? After the Tower of Babel and the flood, it says God called Abraham. We're going to read that. Genesis 12, 3. There's so much I could share. I'm kind of going through this quickly, but you'll need to warm up your thumb for the scriptures we're giving. I will bless those that bless you, God said to Abraham, and curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth would be blessed. Well, Abraham had how many sons? About a dozen. He had Ishmael, Isaac, then after Sarah died, he married Keturah and had several children with Keturah. And some of them ended up being enemies of God's people over time. But which son? God told Abraham, through your son Isaac. And you look and what did God say to Isaac? Genesis 26, 4. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. You notice it says the descendants would be as the dust, as the stars, and as the sand. And they're all different. But they're terms that mean innumerable. You stop counting. I'll make your descendants multiply like the stars of heaven. And I'll give your descendants all these lands. And in your seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. See, the blessing of the Messiah was not just meant for the Jewish people. Who was it meant for? All the nations of the world. The Jews were to introduce and proclaim the Messiah, which they ultimately did at Pentecost, with some reluctance from the nation as a whole, but it was done, and the gospel spread through the Roman Empire. Not only Isaac, but Isaac had a couple of sons, Jacob and Esau. Which one was it? The younger, Jacob. Genesis 28:14. Also your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread across to the west and to the east and north and the south. And in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. You and I are blessed through a descendant of Jacob. His name was Jesus. Now how many sons did Jacob have? 
He had 12. God said, which one was it? The firstborn or the youngest? Neither. It was Judah who was the fourth. And you can read in Genesis 49, as Jacob's dying, he blesses his sons, but listen to what he says to Judah. The scepter, scepter was uh, a staff held by the king. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Of course, a long line of kings in Judah. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And to him, and this is a term for the Messiah, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And the word people there is not uh, just one group of people. It's talking about the nations. The nations will obey him. So this is a king for the nations that would come from the tribe of Judah. Now, which son of Judah? It tells us here, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, God said to David through the prophet Nathan, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I'll set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build me a house from my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now David was sitting in his house and he's thinking it's not fair. The king of Tyre gave me lumber so I could build a really nice palace for myself. But he looked out the window and the ark is flapping under this tattered curtain that had gone through the wilderness. And he thought, it's not really right that God is in this, you know, dilapidated tent and I'm in a palace. I want to build a house for God, a permanent dwelling. And while he's thinking about this, Nathan the prophet comes and gives him this prophecy. So he's thinking about building a temple. Nathan says, you won't do it, but your son will do it. He will build me a house that lives forever. So question, who is Nathan talking about? Solomon or Jesus? Or both? Well, both. Don't be afraid. This is what you call a dual prophecy. It has two fulfillments that are both accurate and they don't conflict. Did David have a son named Solomon that built a temple? Yes. Did that temple last forever? Did Solomon last forever? No. But in the here and now, David was hoping to build the temple and Solomon was the fulfillment of that. And Solomon was in many ways a type of Christ. He was a prophet, wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. But he died and that house got destroyed. But Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands in three days I will make one without hands. He spoke of the resurrection and the church, the body of Christ. And he's going to reign for how long? His kingdom, like when we sing... Handles Messiah forever and ever and ever and ever, right? So this is talking about the son of David, Jesus, who would reign forever. You know, there's something most people miss when they, they uh, talk about this. I think it's pretty deep. Going back to 2 Samuel, the prophecy that he made. And he said, when your days, and this is verse 12. We just read verse 12. He will, 13, he will build a house for me. I'll establish his throne of his kingdom forever. But listen to what it says next. I will be his father, he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the son of men, but my mercy will not depart from him. Well, there's no record of anybody ever putting blows on Solomon. But did Jesus take our iniquity? Did the father chasten him with rods and was he struck for our sake? And so here it talks about the son of David that would be punished, but he would be a king forever. It's interesting, you would throw that in. That's, I think, another prophecy about Jesus. Okay, back to our list. So the ancestry is pretty clearly coming from Judah through David. Amen? You read in Isaiah 11, verse 10. And in that day there will be a root of Jesse who will stand as a banner of the people. For the Gentiles will seek him and his resting place will be glorious. The root of Jesse, who is the son of Jesse? David. He's, uh, and there's some confusion. You know, one place it says that Jesse had uh, eight sons. Another place it says seven. And it may be that Jesse had at one point had eight, one died, and by the time they recorded uh, the second passage, it just talked about the seven sons of Jesse. But I, I didn't know if you'd ever spotted that or not. So um, he's called the root. Now, he's called the branch, he's called the root. You know, 
if you know anything about botany, you know that uh, some trees are very tenacious of life. And even after you cut them down, if there's some life left in the stump, the tree can come back again. In fact, that's what Daniel chapter 4 is talking about. Tree cut down, band of iron, band of bronze, but it comes back to life. Up in the hills where we live, this terrible fire went through. They called it the August Fire 2020. Million acres burned in Northern California. And every time Karen and I go home, we drive through a lot of scorched country. But we're seeing something encouraging. A lot of those oak trees that got burnt off, they've, they're dead. But the roots were protected. And from the roots of those trees, new trees are springing up. Now, it doesn't happen with the pine trees or the fir trees, but the madrone trees, the oak trees, they come up from the root. And there'll be many trees in those places because the root was alive. And so it's using that, that thought when it talks about a root. Even though the nation of Israel had been burned over several times, carried to Babylon, conquered by other nations, this root, this child of David, would continue to uh, stay alive and would come up. You can read in Jeremiah 23, verse 5. I know I'm going fast. I put them on the screen. I hope you write them down or snap a picture so you'll remember these. He says, but behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will raise up to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Jeremiah, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, is foretelling that this Messiah would come from the line of David. Now, the, that's the prophecy foretold. Where do you find the prophecy fulfilled? Go to Luke 127. It's a typical Christmas story. Married to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Where was he from? The house of David. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. And how many times in the life of Jesus did someone say, like blind Bartimaeus, have mercy on me, son of David. This, even this... Uh, uh, Cyrophoenician woman called after Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Heal my daughter. She's demon possessed. When Christ came down the mountain uh, on the donkey into Jerusalem, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna to who? The son of David. It was a ubiquitous term in Israel. They always knew the Messiah would be a descendant of David. And just to be sure there'd be no doubt, and this confuses people, Matthew traces the genealogy from David all the way to Jesus, one person at a time. And you know, when you first start reading the Bible, you go, what are all these names and how do you say them and what in the world does this mean? This is no way to get you into a story. But then after you mature as a Christian, you go, wow, it's not a, it's not a, a fairy tale. It is giving you the exact history of the family and the fathers all the way from Jesus back to David. And to be sure that nobody's confused, Luke, being a doctor, said not only is Jesus related to David through um, Joseph, he's related to David through Mary. And it's interesting, Solomon had a brother named Nathan. They were both sons of David, both from Bathsheba. And Mary's line goes through Nathan to David. Joseph's line goes through Solomon to David but they're both descendants from David. Isn't that amazing? So you wouldn't have to have any doubt about that. All right, number three, for those that are keeping count, the virgin birth was foretold. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel means God with us or with us God. And some have said, well, why didn't anybody ever call Jesus Emmanuel? Well, that's because it was one of his titles, meaning that God is with us. And then it goes on, and a lot of people stop right there. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he might know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Who knows what Solomon's prayer was? What did Solomon pray for? Wisdom. But you know, in Kings, it doesn't just say wisdom. He says, Lord, Give me an understanding heart that I might know how to tell the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. The very same thing that it's saying here. And why did it say curds and honey? 
That's another way of saying milk and honey. It means the richest part of the word, the richest part of the law. The law of the Lord is sweeter than honey. The word of God is called the milk. What was in Jesus' mouth? The law and the word. Amen? That means the law and the prophets was in his mouth. That's what he fed on or fed on. All right, so that's one prophecy. Then you go to Luke 126. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And the angel said to her, I'm jumping ahead here, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Doesn't happen very often that a virgin conceives and brings forth. Did it fulfill that prophecy? You know, that prophecy was given by Isaiah to King Ahaz. When the prophecy was given, Ahaz was concerned because there were three northern powers that were threatening to destroy Judah. And almost as comfort, he said, the sign that God is not going to wipe out his people is going to be the coming of the Messiah when once again a northern power occupied Israel, Romans. They used to come down from the north. And uh, he's saying, but this is a sign that God's people are going to survive. Don't fear. You and I looking down through the ages know that. Matthew 1, 20 and 21. But while he, Joseph, thought about these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you marry your wife. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means, it's Yeshua, it means God is Savior, God is salvation. Did that prophecy come true? All right. Number four, the place of his birth was foretold. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall he come forth to me, the one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, even from everlasting. Now, the reason I think this is interesting is not just because it said Bethlehem, it said Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Um, who knows, you know that there are some cities in North America where there is more than one city by the same name. I know I used to live near Portland, Maine, and then you go to Portland, Oregon. There's probably several Portlands, and they're by ports. And there's a Farmington, New Mexico, and there's several towns called Farmington because it was a farming town. They're all over, big and small. Who knows what the most popular name is for a, a city or a county in North America? Washington. There are between 88 and 90 towns or counties called Washington in the United States. Who knows what is number two? Springfield. Pittsburgh. <laughs> Springfield. Who knows what number three is? No, 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 I was wrong. It's not Springfield. It's Franklin. Franklin's number two, so you get two presidents. The third one is a president also. Third most popular named town. Who knows what that is? Not Jefferson? Not Lincoln? It's Clinton. But it had nothing to do with the president. It's because they had all these Irish immigrants that came in, and they all Clinton town, Clinton city, all over the place. Isn't that interesting? See, now I got your attention with an amazing fact. When I was going through the Christmas story, I saw your faces. You're like, <laughs> this is good stuff, the prophecies. All right. So it's Bethlehem Ephrathah, because there were other, Bethlehem means house of bread. There were several houses of bread. Anywhere there was a bakery, there was a house of bread. But this is the Bethlehem where David was born, and it's not only the Bethlehem where David was born, it's the Bethlehem of the book of Ruth. That's another Old Testament prophecy. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz, you know the beautiful story of redemption in the book of Ruth. Why does Ruth come to Bethlehem? Because there's bread. She met Naomi because there was a famine, but now there's bread. She comes to Bethlehem, but Naomi has nothing. She's destitute. And it's a story of redemption. So Boaz, you know the beautiful love story there. 
Boaz took Ruth, and it's all in the context of a field and bread. Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, a near kinsman, that means. And may his name be famous in Israel. Who knows what his name was? Obed. And Obed, who knows what Boaz's father's name was? Salmon. Who was Boaz's mother? Rahab the harlot. Starting to come together, you draw on the line. And then, oh, they have a boy named Obed, who then has a son named Jesse, who has a son named David. So a lot of the Bible is tracing in the stories the history of Jesus. And you can even go back and talks about, there's four women mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. You know who they are? Rahab, Sarah, Ruth, Tamar. And there's a whole interesting story there about Tamar and Judah. So Judah ended up having twins. And he thought he was having a fling. It didn't go the way he expected. But anyway, you have to read that for yourself because it may not be appropriate right now. So Ruth is really, the story of Ruth is a prophecy that there's going to be a redeemer through Obed. They were readopted into the land of Bethlehem. So it tells where he would be born. Now, if you read the earlier part, it says that when the angel comes to visit Joseph, He's in Nazareth. But says the boy's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. How's God going to work that out? It's so like, you know, 80 miles away. Oh, it tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. He starts out as Octavian Caesar. He defeats Mark Anthony there in Egypt, and he ends up becoming uh, Caesar Augustus. And we have a month named after him. You know what month that is? August, so why don't we have Christmas in August? It seems like that's when it ought to be. Anyway, if nothing else, it says that he made a tax that the whole world should be registered. The idea is the whole world is registered. Why don't they have tax day in August? They do it in April. Do you know that there's even a prophecy in the Old Testament about Augustus Caesar? You look in Daniel chapter 11, verse 20. It goes through this litany of things up to the Messiah. And it says, there will arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom. That was about Augustus. And it also fits into the New Testament story. One more key that Jesus is the fulfillment. Amen. No one else is going to amen my sermon. I will. <laughs> so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. They had to go to their hometown. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. There it is. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. You have it again. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. By the way, that's another fulfillment. You read in John chapter 1, verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Here the Messiah, not only the creator of the world, comes into the world. Does the world know? No. Wise men come into Jerusalem. Where is he born king? I said, what are you talking about? His own people didn't know. And when he came to his hometown, they didn't even have a room for him. He came into his own, and his own received him not. I hope that will not be the case in your heart. Now you've got point number five, the sign of his birth. We just alluded to this. Here's the prophecy foretold. Numbers 24, 17. Balaam, the prophet, he said, but now, uh, he said, but not now, I behold him, but not near. He means he's looking way down in the future. A star will come out of Jacob and a scepter. And that means a king will rise out of Israel. What do you think the wise men were studying? By the way, the wise men, that, that word is magios. That's the same word that is used. They probably came from Mesopotamia. There was a tribe there. They were the Medes. The Medians 
were really the priests. They were the studied people. The Persians ended up becoming the kings, but the Medians were the king makers. They could not have a Persian king unless the Median priests approved. And you can read where when um, that Babylonian king saw the handwriting on the wall, the queen came in and said, there is a man in your kingdom that your father Nebuchadnezzar made the leader of all the Magios. Now, that's, I'm talking about the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. It's the same word that you find in the New Testament. So these wise men, oh, we don't know how many there were. I mean, the Christmas cards always have three, and we sing about we three men because there's three gifts. Could have been two guys bringing three gifts. It could have been 40 of them. Uh, I frankly think there were more than three because it says when they came, all of Jerusalem was stirred up. They're just three guys coming to a busy town like that probably wouldn't have happened. But they came with a caravan bringing their treasures and they'd come a long journey. Probably took them 40 days approximately if they had come from Mesopotamia to get there. And he came into his own and they weren't ready. But it says a star would arise. Isaiah 60 verse 6. The multitude of camels will cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah and those of Sheba will come. They will bring gold and incense. What do you think that incense was? Frankincense, that's where you get the word frankincense, and myrrh. And they will proclaim the praises of the Lord. Isaiah is prophesying when these Gentiles would come with their gifts and their camels to honor the Messiah. Amen? Look in Song of Solomon. It mentions it several times, but chapter 3 especially, Song of Solomon is... It's a beautiful story of Christ and his church. And it says here, who's coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with a merchant's fragrant powers. And you go to verse 10. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold. Right there, you got gold, frankincense, and myrrh talking about this wedding between Christ and the church. That's the analogy in the Song of Solomon. And you go to the New Testament who here doesn't know the story. Now after Jesus was born, Matthew 2, verse 1 and 2, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that has been born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. How did they get the prophecies? Well, Balaam was a prophet from Mesopotamia. And when he was making his prophecies, by King Balak there, they always had someone writing down the oracles of these prophets. And it was written down. Not only that, how long was Daniel in Mesopotamia? Did the people in Mesopotamia have copies of the Jewish scriptures? Didn't King Nebuchadnezzar and King Darius make proclamations that nobody should speak against the God of Daniel? Don't you think they had copies in that vast library in Babylon of the Hebrew scriptures? And they knew that the Jewish people's prophecies came true. So they're studying these things, and they saw the sign. That star was not, people say, oh, I wonder if it was a Halley's Comet. Or maybe there was a confluence of some stars and planets, and it made it brighter. And It was none of that, because it says the star came and rested over the house. How can a star way up in the heavens point to a particular house? This is like the Shekinah glory. It's like a band of angels that are shining, that are leading them on this journey. And it would disappear during the day. That's why they lost sight of it when they went to Jerusalem. But after they left, it reappeared and took them right to the house. All right. So, that works. Matthew 2.11. They came into the house. They saw the young child with his mother. They fell down and they worshipped him. And they opened their treasures. They presented to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. By the way, not only was there Myrrh at the birth of Christ. Myrrh is something used for embalming as well as healing. And at his death, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, John 19, 39, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. So there was a gift of myrrh at his birth because he's a king, and there's a big gift at his death. Anyone here still remember that song? They don't sing it anymore. It's not a 7-Eleven song. It's called Ivory Palaces. Some of you, what a beautiful song. Talks about myrrh is scenting his garments in that song. All right, then you've got the prophecy number six. 
We're getting there. Hang on. God with us. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful. You remember when the parents of Samson said, what is your name that we might honor you? He said, don't ask after my name. It is Wonderful. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. It will forever expand. All through the history of the world, kingdoms come and go. They've actually got a YouTube online. You can look at the maps. It's got all of the kingdoms of Europe and the changes of power around the Mediterranean that have happened from the time of Christ. It's amazing how many times the land changes hands, the kingdoms rise and fall, and it looked like for a while there, Napoleon and Charlemagne were going to have it all, and then they lost it all. But his kingdom, there will be no end. It'll ever expand. That's got to be Jesus, right? And it says, a child is given. His name. Something about the name. Names are important. When you pick names for your kids, be careful. My brother grew up and my, my dad called him Falcon. He thought that was cool. But the last name's Bachelor. That's already a problem. And he got teased a lot growing up because of his name. That flaming red hair. Karen and I were in uh, New Guinea. And the last meeting, they wanted to thank us and our team, and they brought us all up front, and they're having a lot of you know, nice accolades and thanks, and some of them probably watching now. And, and during our series, there was 150,000 people came. Several babies were born right there in the campground. And they brought the parents up front that we could pray for them, and they said, they're naming these children after us. Now, not just me, it was other members of the team. And this one couple had twins. And so we're standing next to the couple. They're holding twins. And they said, they've named one Douglas and one Bachelor, two boys. <laughs> and I said through the translator, I said, can I make a suggestion? I'm thinking to myself, this poor kid's going to grow up with the name Bachelor. Douglas is okay. You can find that on a keychain at Walmart, you know. But <laughs> and so I said, uh, it's a true story. We're up there. All these people are watching. I said, can you ask them, why don't they give one the name Douglas and one the name Edward? That's my middle name, Edward. And he whispered to them and said, oh, yeah, they smiled. Edward, Douglas Edward. I said, Phew. I just saved that kid from a life of teasing. How are you ever going to get a date or married if your name is Bachelor? They're going to always think you're flirting even after you're married, right? So be careful. Names mean something. Anyway, so his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it tells us that his government would have no end. Now you go to the New Testament fulfillment. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, those under the earth. And Matthew 21, 15, but when the priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, his name is called what? Wonderful. Peter says, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Another one says that this child would be preceded by a forerunner that would introduce him. What was his name? Now, you're going to get, this is a bonus prophecy because all of it is in one verse in the New Testament. You just need to go to Mark 1, verse 1 through 3. First words in the book of Mark. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. He takes you to the prophecy. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He's quoting from Isaiah and Malachi. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And who was that? John the Baptist. And before the birth of Jesus, it talks about the miraculous birth of John. Just like Abraham and Sarah Zachariah and Elizabeth had this promised, longed-for child that Jesus said was the greatest of the prophets. This was also foretold, and it happened. Now, here's, I thought I'd save some of the best for last. Do you know it tells about the time of his birth is prophesied? They could have known the time of his birth. Well, the wise men did, 
And maybe the shepherds were talking about it. Daniel 9.25, now you know this, but listen. Know therefore and understand, Gabriel tells us, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, that's 457 B.C., it's found in Ezra chapter 7, until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven and 62 is how many? 69. 60, that's 483 days, but in prophecy a day is a year. 483 years. So you got 483 years from 457. That takes you to 27 AD. You still with me? So that gives us the date for his anointing, his baptism. He began his ministry at his baptism. How do you get the date of his birth? You could not serve as a priest until you were 30. All you had to do is count back. Look at Numbers 423. From 30 years old and above, even to 50 year olds, you shall number them, the priests, the Levites, who perform the service to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And now look in Luke 3.23. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at 30 years of age. How old was Joseph when he went out over Egypt? He was 30. How old was David when he finally began to reign over the United Kingdom of Israel? He was 30. And so those that were astute would be thinking, well, the Messiah is not going public till he is legally old enough to teach. A rabbi could not teach until he was at least 30. I was always kind of tickled when Mormon missionaries would come to my house and they're usually, you know, young men right out of high school. I would say, Elder Smith. You know what I mean? And the guy's barely got peach flaws and he's elder. And I remember when I joined the church, I was still in my 20s. They asked me to be an elder. I said, are you kidding? <laughs> an elder? Your car insurance doesn't even go down until you're 25, right? So they knew that he wouldn't be able to teach or minister until he was 30. Just count back. Comes to 4 BC, which is when he is born. So it even gave the time of his birth. Isn't that exciting? And all of it's happened. Amen? Listen to this, Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. Paul said, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. Paul seemed to think you could know when he would be born and the fullness of time would come. See what I'm saying? They saw the prophecy saying that his birth was a fullness of time. Born of a woman under the law to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Number nine, an effort to exterminate the Messiah. You know this? Jeremiah 31, 15, thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And that's the prophecy quoted by Matthew after King Herod in chapter 2 of Matthew sends the soldiers into Bethlehem because the wise men did not come back to tell him where this king of the Jews was. And king of the Jews was Herod's title. And he saw that he was mocked. He got angry. Now Herod was, he was quite a, a scoundrel, magnificent builder, but you didn't want to be part of his family. He killed several family members, including at least one wife. In fact, the Romans used to tease Herod. They said it'd be safer to be his pig than his family because he wouldn't eat unclean food, but he'd kill his family members. And he sent his soldiers into Bethlehem and said, kill every baby boy two years old and under. And it was just a horrific event. You know, it's not the first time the devil's done that. That's what happened in the days of Moses. The Pharaoh said, kill all the baby boys because the devil thought that a savior was coming. A savior was coming, but Moses wasn't the Messiah. And he did it again when Athaliah was queen. She tried to annihilate the seed of David, killed them all except Joash survived, hidden in the temple. So the devil has tried to annihilate, and they said this would also happen with the Messiah. Did it come true, friends? Then number 10, out of Egypt. It says that the Messiah would somehow, born in Bethlehem, but come out of Egypt. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That's another dual prophecy. God's people, 
the children of Israel were called out of Egypt. But here, this is, you know, I'm not making this up. Matthew, who is a prophet and gospel writer, he's saying that is also a fulfillment of Jesus, who when Herod tried to kill the babies, the angel said, Joseph, you better take that child right now, get out of town, go to Egypt until you hear from me. And he went down to Egypt, and then the Lord spoke to Joseph and said, Herod's dead, it's safe for you to come back, but you better not go back to Bethlehem because the son of Herod's on the throne, and he's a tyrant, and he went back to Nazareth where he had worked previously. Came true just as the Bible foretold. Amen? Amen. And then here's the bonus one, number 11. He'd be called the Nazarene. Judges, now you might be wondering, why does it say that? I, first, I'm going to actually start with Matthew here. I'm going to talk about the fulfillment. Matthew 2, verse 23. And he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Now, there's no prophecy that says he will be called a Nazarene, but the word Nazareth and Nazarite are very similar, and they believe they came from the same root. A Nazarite is one who is separated. A Nazarene, or Nazareth rather, is a branch, when a branch separates off of a tree, and they're related words. The only place I could take that was back to the story of Samson, where God, for Samson, did the same thing he did for Mary, in that they came to a woman who had no children, she was barren, said, you're gonna have a miracle son, who will deliver his people, and let me tell you what his name is going to be. You know, there's only a few baby boys that are named by angels. And Samson was named. And Samson was betrayed by his own people. Samson was sold by Delilah for silver. Samson was blinded. Jesus, they put a hood over him. Samson was beaten. And Samson was filled with the Spirit, and he stretched out his arms to defeat the enemies of God's people. He is a type of Christ. All through these Old Testament stories, we see the examples of Jesus. Amen? You know, it's wonderful. I remember in the good old days, before they had all the modern conveniences for childbirth, when uh, you never had to send out an announcement that you had a baby in a neighborhood. Everyone heard the mother screaming because they had him at home. And now that, that's gotten a little better. And you never knew whether to buy things for a boy or a girl until D-Day, right? And now with ultrasound, you can not only tell if it's a boy or girl, and it's getting more and more sophisticated. You can tell if they're going to ride a bicycle backwards and play the piccolo. I mean, you can, your jeans and eye color, they can tell all kinds of things now. And it's just going to keep getting that way. But here in the Bible, I mean, now we get a little advanced notice about a birth, maybe a few months Hundreds, if not thousands of years before God sent his son, he gave us extremely precise detail so when Jesus came, we would know that this is the most important birth in history. It's been said before, but I think it bears repeating. It came from a, a phrase called one solitary life. And it talks about the life of Jesus. Born in an obscure village under odd circumstances, the child of a peasant woman, he grew up in another obscure village where he worked as a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher, three and a half actually. He never married, never owned a home, never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never wrote a book or held office. He did none of the things we typically accompany with greatness. Yet 20 centuries have come and gone, and today world history is dated from his birth. His teachings constitute the world's largest religion, all the armies that ever marched and all the navies that have ever sailed and all the parliaments that have ever sat and all the kings that have ever reigned all put together have not affected the life of man upon earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. That was foretold. God brought his son into the world. God himself came into the world to show us what God is like. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To show us how to live, says we ought to walk even as he walked. A Christian is a follower of the teachings and example of Jesus. And then to die as a sacrifice for all of our sins if we repent of our sins and we accept him. And 
That's the most important thing, friends, that we will choose to tell the Lord we are sorry for our sins and to accept Him. <laughs> 